اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم والحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء واعز المرسلین حبیب الہ العالمین العبد المؤید والنور المسدد المصطفى الامجد ابی القاسم محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد فيقول الحق وقوله الصدق في محكم التنزيل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما كان الله ليذر المؤمنين على ما أنتم عليه حتى يميز الخبيث من الطيب آمنا بالله ورسله صدق الله العلي العظيم تهيستن اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى محمد وعلى محمد to hasten the reappearance of our awaited Imam, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif, I request we recite three salawat for the loudest of our voices. Respected brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. A conflict is an act of disagreement between people with opposing opinions, principles, or even beliefs. A conflict or the reason of a conflict may vary. They can be, for example, they can be racial, or they can be personal, or in some cases they can be even political. In some cases also, a conflict can escalate into becoming an armed conflict. When we reflect back on the history of the religion of Islam, mainly during the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, we would notice, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We would notice that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, along with the Muslims, had to go through many conflicts beginning with the Battle of Badr and ending with the Battle of Hunayn. Those conflicts were mainly centered around the revelation of the Holy Quran and the spread of the Islamic Da'wah. And where you will find that Quraysh and its allies employed all their powers to confront the Islamic Da'wah. And that is what historians refer to, believe it or not, as the conflict of Tanzil, the conflict over the, over the revelation of the Holy Quran. After the martyrdom of the Prophet وسلم, there also began many stages of conflicts and that were referred to as inner conflicts in the Islamic society. Historians call them the conflicts over ta'wil, the interpretation of the Holy Quran. And many of us memorize the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, in where he says to Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi, Ya Ali, أنا أقاتل على التنزيل وأنت تقاتل على التأويل وعلي I will fight over the revelation of the Holy Quran and you will fight over the revelation the interpretation of the Holy Quran and those conflicts then the beginning of the stages of those conflicts they did not escalate to become armed conflicts take for example a conflict that began during the reign of the first Khalifa Abu Bakr there was a conflict over the tafsir of the Quran and where we all know that Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi compiled the Quran along with the tafsir from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and he went to the court of the first Khalifa to present it to the Muslim Ummah. The second Khalifa Umar bin al-Khattab was present there and he told him that we are, on, we are not in need for your Quran. We do have our own Quran. And it's as if he's insinuating that as if Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, invented a new Quran. That was one of the conflicts. Or for example, take a conflict that also was present during the reign of the second Khalifa, which was also very dangerous indeed. And even though those conflicts were not armed per se, yet they, were, they did affect the Islamic Ummah and the future for, of it indeed. So that conflict that began during the era of the second Khalifa was referred to as the conflict over the documentation of hadith, where you will find that the second Khalifa, 
he prevented the companions of the Prophet وسلم, to document the hadiths that they heard from the Prophet وسلم, much less narrating them. And then what did he do in return? What he did is that he encouraged people to memorize the Holy Quran. In fact, he set rewards with a lot of money for the ones that would recite the Holy Quran. And thereupon you will find that there was a group that arose in the Muslim society referred to as Al-Qurra, the reciters. These are the ones that memorized the Holy Quran upon the advice of the second Khalifa and were given extra pay, a great salary, a lot of money from the Muslim treasury. And that resulted in what? That basically resulted in a rise of a theocratic religious political group in the Muslim Ummah that later were known as the Khawarij. Don't you realize that? And the fact that they were detached from the tafsir of the Quran, it made it extremely hard in order for you to speak any sense with them, just like what happened with Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam during the battle of Safin. And thereupon, the second stage of that inner conflict referred to as the conflict of ta'wil of the interpretation began. And it began, only began, during the reign of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I ask you if you don't mind to rise insha'Allah and come forward so the ones that are coming from the back would find a spot to sit in. Rahimallahu man dhakar al-qa'ima min ali Muhammad. Bring it down a little. More. This is perfect. Yeah. And thereupon began the second stage of the conflict referred to as the conflict of Ta'wil. But that conflict during the reign of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi it did escalate to become an armed conflict, such as the Battle of the Camel, for instance. But the pinnacle of that conflict, and focus on this point, please, the pinnacle of that conflict was in none but the two battles of Safin and Karbala. And if you were to reflect on both Safin and Karbala and reflect back on the history of the early stages of the da'wah in the Prophet, during the life of the Prophet وسلم, you would notice that Safin and Karbala were none but an extension of Badr and Uhud. The pioneer of shirk, Abu Sufyan, was present in the both battles of Badr and Uhud. And thereupon also the pioneers of the ones that stood in front of the revival of the true teachings of the religion of Islam were none but the sons of Abu Sufyan, Muawiyah and Yazid. And may Allah bless the soul of Ammar ibn Yasir radhwanullahi ta'ala alayhi. Ammar ibn Yasir, when he was approached in the battle of Safin by some companions, and he was asked as to why were you standing on the side of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam fighting against Muawiyah and some other companions. Focus on the reply of Ammar. Ammar replied, he said, do you see that banner right in front of you, that black banner in front of you? And he pointed to the banner that Amr ibn al-As was carrying on the battlefield. He said, that's the banner of Amr ibn al-As. I had fought against it three times before alongside the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And this is the fourth time and the most wicked and most evil out of all of them. And you would notice that that's why Imam Hussein salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad And you would notice why Imam Hussein salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi as when he was asked about why is he marching to Karbala and why is he uprising against Yazid he said I want to I want to walk on the path of, of the sunnah of my, of my grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and my father Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu wa sallam alayhi. And even though there are khulafa in between, yet Imam Hussein alayhi salam skipped them. And thus you would notice, and I've said this before, and I would like to repeat again to confirm this truth, you will find that in every conflict there exists three sides. The first two, or the first side, are, or the first two are the two groups fighting against each other. And that is cut and clear. Meaning what? 
regardless whether one side of the, is on falsehood and the other side is on truth, yet at least they are clear. You would know them. And then there is that third side, and that is considered the side that stands in the middle, or what is referred to as the neutral side. When we focus back on history, we would find that that side throughout history always existed in every conflict, or in every war, or in every hardship, or even in every struggle. The Quran paid very well attention to that neutral side in numerous verses, be it in Surah At-Tawbah, for example, when he exposed the neutral side as many of them ended up becoming hypocrites, or in some other verses, for example, when he exposed that neutral side, such as the verses that discuss the battle of Uhud. And believe it or not that that neutral side is the most dangerous side out of all. And in many cases, that neutral side ended up becoming the decisive factor. Just like that neutral side in the battle of Uhud, as we mentioned earlier. Throughout history, even within the messengers prior to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, you would find that with every prophet, that neutral side always existed. And that neutral side is the side that the ummah suffered from the most. They existed in the battle of Uhud, as I mentioned, which was considered the seed of Nifaq. As many of us might know, that the battle of Uhud was the beginning of the seed of Nifaq. It exposed a political party within the Islamic Ummah that became hypocrites, led by Abdullah ibn Abi Salul. And they were ended up being the decisive factor in the uh, Battle of Uhud, along with what we refer to as the fifth column. Meaning what? The hypocrites that are or do exist in every movement or every uprising, and they act within it, yet in reality they are acting against it. So that side always existed, be it in Uhud as we mentioned, be it in Tabuk, or even in the Battle of Jamal, or take for example the Battle of Safin. Imam Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam would sit on the member of Kufa and encourage the Muslims to join the campaign to fight Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, on the contrary would also sit on his member giving a fatwa that this war is haram and he would tell the Muslims that both Ali and Muawiyah are on falsehood. Subhanallah, this brings to mind the hadith by Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu wa sallamu and where he says, الدهر أنزلني وأنزلني حتى قالوا علي ومعاوية that I live in a time that has degraded my status so much so that people began saying علي and معاوية it's as if that they are both equal or even on the same level so you find that that neutral side existed in Safin or even that neutral side that existed mainly in Karbala, or even before Karbala, let me take you a bit to Saqifah. What happened in Saqifah is that the majority of the Muslim society took the Sada neutral side. And there's an incident that occurred where one of the companions came to Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. He said to him, Ya Ali, why don't you rise with your sword and fight for your right? Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam replied back to him and said, if I only had my father Abu Talib, and my brother Ja'far with me, then trust me, I would have fought for my right. Us? Meaning what? Meaning that those two are steadfast. They're willing to die and sacrifice for the cause. They're not willing to fight up until a moment, and then they take the neutral side. In Karbala, the same thing happened. The neutral side existed in the Islamic Ummah. If you were to focus on one of the things that Imam Hussein sallallahu wa sallam one of the things that Imam Hussein sallallahu did before he began his journey was to meet with three people. And I want you to focus on those three people, those three personas. The first one was Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Bakr. The second one was Abdullah ibn Umar. The third one was Abdullah ibn Zubair. He met with them and he told them, I want you to join me on my cause. Imam Hussein alayhi salam wanted his movement and his uprising to be as universal and inclusive as possible. He told them what we need to do is to leave our differences aside and unite on a cause to fight a greater enemy such as Yazid ibn Muawiyah. 
because Yazid's aim was to totally end Islam, let alone the Muslims. And, but the three of them decided to take the neutral side. Imam Hussein alayhi salam said to them that each and every one of you will get humiliated by Bani Umayyah in one way or another. And if you look into the history, you would notice how each and every one of them was disrespected by Bani Umayyah, beginning from with the reign of Yazid ibn Muawiyah indeed. Abdullah ibn Umar, for example, when Al-Hajjaj became the governor of Medina, he went to Al-Hajjaj and he told him, I want to give you bay'ah. Al-Hajjaj was sleeping. He looked at him and he said, then where was that bay'ah when it was given, when there was bay'ah given to Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib, obviously Al-Hajjaj does not like Ali ibn Abi Talib in order for him to say Ali is salam or not. We say Ali is salam. He told him, then where was your bay'ah when Ali ibn Abi Talib was being appointed as the Khalifa? In fact, take my foot and shake it and that would be considered a bay'ah. An absolute humiliation to a son of a companion, let alone him, arguably being a companion to begin with. Abdullah ibn Zubair also, the, this, despite the fact that he was killed by Bani Umayyah while hanging on to the curtains of the Kaaba in the Haram, it has been narrated that one time he also went to visit Muawiyah. In one of those visits, he went to Muawiyah and he entered upon him. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan was taking a nap. When he looked at Muawiyah, he stood on top of him, basically. I guess he was a trusted person to enter on the chamber of Muawiyah. He looked at Muawiyah and he smiled when Muawiyah opened his eyes. He told him, Muawiyah, don't you think that right now I could have assassinated you? Muawiyah looked at him and he said, no, you're not worthy enough to do that. He said, what do you mean you're saying this to me while I am the one who stood and confronted Ali ibn Abi Talib on the battlefield in the battle of the camel, Muawiyah laughed. He told him, listen, Abdullah, probably you and your father confronted Ali ibn Abi Talib on the battlefield in the battle of the camel, but probably Ali ibn Abi Talib was fighting you with his bare left hand, while with his right hand, he was swinging Dhul Fiqar, probably defeating a legion. Isn't it? You find that even Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan said this to a person like Abdullah ibn Zubair. So that neutral side also existed in the events of Karbala. And you would notice that that neutral side still exists up until this day. The Islamic Ummah suffered the most or else what do you think happened to each and every one of our Imams? That they all suffered from that neutral side. And up until this day, the Islamic Ummah suffers from the neutral side. Let me give you an example. Many of you probably were not even born or maybe were children or teenagers during the 2006 war on south of Lebanon launched from the Zionist regime. Believe it or not, many of the sides that are right now standing against the resistance in Palestine are the very entities that also stood against the resistance in south of Lebanon, believe it or not, the same exact ones. And the ones that wanted to support the resistance in south of Lebanon are the same entities that are right now supporting the resistance in Palestine and Gaza. You find that that neutral side still exists until now. The unfortunate reality is that nowadays you would find that there's a split in the Islamic Ummah. And that split not only consists of Shia and Sunnah, no. You find that there are Sunni, Shia, standing even against Palestine. And on the contrary, there are also Sunni, Shia, standing with Palestine. And yes, even though it is hard to digest and fathom, but it is unfortunate that some people who claim to follow the message of the Ahlul Bayt and follow the school of thought of Muhammad and Al-Muhammad, they come and they speak against resistance. Many people are the same exact very people that said that we are not to be involved in the battle of Karbala, that this is a war of the kings. Those very people still exist. Some people, the unfortunate reality, and what really does not make any sense to me is that how could a person who believes in the Ahlul Bayt school of thought not see with clarity and truth? May Allah bless the soul of Shaheed Mutahari. Shaheed Mutahari said something genius one time. He said the Shimmer of 1400 years ago is dead. He's gone. Get to know the Shimmer of your time. The Shimmer of 1400 years ago was slaughtering the children of Imam Hussein in Karbala. And that modern day Shimmer is slaughtering indeed also the 
children of Gaza. But the difference is, is that the Shemir of 1400 years ago was using a sword. And this Shemir nowadays is just using a jet. So you would know that that neutral side, even up until this day, existed. And subhanAllah, sometimes having noble traits, principles, chivalry, and nobility combined, even with a bit of religiosity, can lead you to the righteous path more than having traditional religiosity alongside with love, even if it was towards the Ahlul Bayt. Let me give you a proof. There are two personas that were present in Karbala. One of them was on the opposite side of Imam Hussein Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, which was none but Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. Yet Al-Hur, he had the traits of chivalry in him to the point that when Imam Hussein alayhi salam insulted him, he did not return back the insult. He told him, I know that your mother is Fatima and I will not dare to even utter a word against her. That by itself is a noble trait. Even though Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyah was on the opposite side, yet what did he have? Political awareness, yes? And then he realized that he's on the side of falsehood and therefore he joined the side of truth. Take on the opposite end, there was in the camp of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, a man by the name of al dahhaq ibn Abdullah al-Mashriqi. I myself humbly dissected his narrative in previous lectures, if I'm not mistaken, it's available on YouTube under the title of an unknown figure in Karbala. al dahhaq ibn Abdullah al-Mashriqi was a Shia. He went to Karbala, met with Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Imam Hussein alayhi salam asked him to join him, briefly speaking. He did agree to join Imam Hussein, but he put conditions to join him. He said to the Imam that I'm willing to fight for you up until you are by yourself. That's when I don't think there's a reason for me to stay anymore and you have to exempt me from your bay'ah. And believe it or not, that's exactly what he did. It is absolutely complex to under some, such a complexing persona, a, f a confusing persona indeed. I mean, the Haq ibn Abdullah al-Mashriq, believe it or not, he's one of the most, he was one of the most ferocious fighter, fighters present in Karbala. He fought courageously. And even some narrations say that he stayed up until even the martyrdom of al-Abbas alayhi salam, when Imam Hussein alayhi salam literally was by himself. And then he went up to the Imam and he told him that now I shall leave you. You should exempt me from your bay'ah. Imam Hussein alayhi salam looked at him, wondered, and he said, and how will you leave? I mean, you want to leave me right now? He said, yes, there's no point for me to stay. I mean, you're going to die anyways. Do you see sometimes when being overly traditional and overly logical in certain things? And therefore, he actually left the Imam. He lived after Karbala and narrated some of the incidents of Karbala, believe it or not. Such a confusing persona, leaving the Imam even when the Imam was by himself. So you find that Abdullah ibn Abdullah al mashriq being a Shia, still left the Imam. Where Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi, being not a Shia, only having that respect that many of the Muslim Ummah did driver the Ahlul Bayt, believe it or not. It did not. They did not have to be Shia in order for them to love Ahlul Bayt. Yet that a person like Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi sacrificed himself for the Imam, being the first martyr, uh, martyr arguably, on the land of Karbala. The verse that I started with tonight was a verse that was revealed during the battle of Uhud. Verse number 178 in Surah Al-Amran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ma kana Allahu liyadhar al-mu'minin ala ma antum alayh. Hatta yameez al-khabitha min al-tayyib. Allah is not to leave the believers on the state or in the state that you are in unless Unless he separates the wicked, the impure, from the pure. And that's exactly what happened in the battle of Uhud. Because after the Muslims went in despair because of the result of the battle, Allah told them that at the end of the day, the path of Haq is the path that you shall be examined on. Is the path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall not leave you on this, in the state that you are in. Except that he shall separate from the pure, the pure from the impure. And indeed in every struggle and in every conflict and in every war, the pure are separated from the impure. And what I would like to do tonight is to further dissect this topic 
depending on the following points in reference to the events that took place in Al-Kufa, mainly upon the arrival of Muslim Ibn Aqil, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh. Number one, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. One, I would like to highlight the significance of the verse in relation to an incident that occurred mainly on the night of the 10th of Muharram in Karbala. And I would like to make an ethical point out of this. The second point, I would like to briefly shed the light on Kufa from a social perspective. And the third and final point is that what was the turning point in the events that took place in Al-Kufa? And before I proceed, I would like you to provide me with a loud salawat. The verse that we started with, as I said, verse number 178 in Surah Al-Amran. That verse, Imam Hussein Salawatullahi wa salamu was reciting it on the night of the 10th of Muharram. What happened is that when both armies set camp, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he placed guards on the outskirts of the camp. Those two guards were Burair ibn Khudair al-Hamdani, uh, Rudwanullahi ta'ala alayhi. And the other one was al dahhaq ibn Abdullah al-Mashriqi, the one I just mentioned earlier. On the other side also, Omar ibn Sa'ad placed guards on the, to protect the camp. What happened is that Imam Hussein alayhi salam was walking around the camp and he was reciting this verse. Allah will not leave the Muslims or the believers in the state that you are in unless he separates the impure from the pure. One of the guards of Yazid ibn Muawiyah, or the, the army of Yazid ibn Muawiyah, looked at Imam Hussein and he said, Oh, Hussein, are you claiming that you are the pure and we are the impure? We are the wicked? But no, by God, you are the impure and we are the pure. You understand the dangers sometimes of religiosity without awareness? That person probably memorized the Quran. That person probably read the Quran, but did not come on the verse of Ayat al Tathir that Imam Hussein is of the pure mentioned in the Holy Quran. al dahhaq ibn Abdullah al-Mashriqi looked at Burair ibn Khudair. He said, Burair, do you know who this is? He said, no. He said, this is Abu Harb al-Subay'i, a man named Abu Harb al-Subay'i from Kufa. He's a soldier in the army of Yazid ibn Muawiyah and Karbala. Burair ibn Khudair, he stood up and he walked up to Abu Harb al-Subay'i and he wanted to preach to him. Burair ibn Khudair had a status in Kufa, believe it or not. Burair ibn Khudair was considered a Quran teacher in the Masjid of Kufa. Many of the people of Kufa were very familiar with Burair ibn Khudair. And they looked up to him, they honored him. To the point that, believe it or not, when Burair ibn Khudair appeared on the battlefield in Karbala, many of the Kufans did not want to confront him, did not want to kill him out of respect of the fact that he was a Quran teacher. Hey? Burair ibn Khudair went up to Abu Harb al-Subay'i. And I want you to focus on this and look what happened. See, I've said before that there are certain incidents that took place in Karbala that are worthy to reflect upon, not only the brutality and the tragedy and the killing that happened. Is that reflect on those incidents. And sometimes let's reflect on ourselves because we might be put in the same exact test. Isn't it? Burair ibn Khudar, and watch the dangers of choosing wrong friends in your life. The dangers of associating yourself with people that are immoral. And what they could lead you to. Burair ibn Khudar looked at Abu Harb al-Subayr and he said, and he preached to him, he said, why don't you repent? Or at the least, sorry, why don't you join us? Or at the least repent. Abu Harb al-Subayr looked back at him and he laughed. And he said, he said in Arabic, وَمَنْ يُنَادِمْ يَزِيدَ بِنْ عَذَرَ He had a friend. He had a friend named Yazid ibn Adara. Yazid ibn Adara was considered his drinking buddy. Nowadays, you hear this expression sometimes. Some people say, this is my drinking buddy. When al dahhaq told Burair ibn Khudair that this is Abu Harb al-Subay'i, he told him that Abu Harb is known to be, focus on this, a person who loves entertainment majalis. He always likes to entertain himself. He's never serious. 
You know, subhanAllah, there's a beautiful hadith that comes from Imam Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam alayhi. Allahumma wa sallam. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says in a narration, Majalisuna madarisuna. Our majlis is our madrasa. This is the point of majalis. He told him that Abu Harb al-Subayi is a person that likes entertainment majalis. Right? He joins entertainment majalis. How many of us sometimes get invited to a party? And they say, no, I'm just going to sit there, but I'm not going to drink. Or I'm just going to hang out for a second, for a bit, but I'm not going to pay attention to the music in the background. How many of us get invited to weddings and are forced, or they feel compelled to go because it's a family relative? Even though that wedding might have haram in it, might have mixed gathering in it, it might have music in it, haram music in it. But then we say, you know what, I'm just going to show up, pay my respects. There's nothing I can do about it. He told him that that man, this is the type of majalis that he likes. He told him, huwa rajulun miptalun. He likes entertainment majalis, he likes batal. He likes the majalis of batal. Mithakun, he's a joker, he's never serious. He always likes to joke. You know, there's a beautiful hadith by Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. It says what? That was a lazy salawat, by the way. I expect a louder one. That's a salawat. There you go. So you find Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam says in a hadith. He says, لا تضحك كثيرا فتذهب هيبتك. Is that do not joke a lot, for your haiba, your prestige will be gone. It's good to maintain a balance sometimes. Carry yourself as a man, mainly as a Muslim man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you in an image, and he provided you with that power of deen. It's not wrong to have a sense of humor, but it's two different things to have a sense of humor and to become a derider, a mocker, that you're constantly mocking people, right? And just a, a short search on YouTube, and you find those pranks videos indeed, that you wonder sometimes is that how much our society is degrading to that level. That you want to be famous on social media, all what you need to do is just expose your stupidity. Isn't it? It's a foolishness. SubhanAllah, that's how you become famous nowadays. He said, Wa rajalun matthakun munadim. Munadim what? Meaning that he sits in the majalis of khamr, majalis of alcohol. When Burair ibn Khudair preached to him, this person lived an immoral life, addicted to his own desires to the point that he said, then what about my friend Yazid ibn Hadara? He said, I have a friend that is considered my drinking buddy. We go out together all the time. Is that who's going to stay with him? Who's going to go out with him? Who's going to keep him company? You realize sometimes something as simple as many of us that are sitting in this room, whether when we were younger or even now when we have children, when your parents warn you from having the wrong friends in your life, and you rebel, and you always uh, retaliate, and tell them, no, these are my friends. I still want to hang out with them. They're saying this for a reason. You see, psychologists say that every person or every, uh, every human being passes through a stage from the age of 14 up until the age of 19, 20. And that stage, each one of us would look at his parents and say, my parents are stupid. My parents don't know what they're talking about. My parents are too ignorant. They're not upgraded. They're too old school. And then when you hit 21, or when you get married, you look back and you say, my parents were right. My parents were absolutely right. And what's the solution to this? I'm not going to raise a problem without providing a solution. The solution is invest in proper friends for your children. Because every child at that age will not pay attention to their parents. Your father, right? Or for example, your, um, um, that your child will look at you and you would give them a piece of advice. And they would not listen to you. But you might even have a friend. Or their friend's father might give them the same piece of advice and they would actually pay attention to it. How many of us sometimes would have a child that would run back to us and tell us, oh, my best friend's dad told me this. Well, I've been telling you this all this time, isn't it? Yeah? You know what they say, right? They say every Mawlana has that one son <laughs> that ends up giving him a headache, right? 
Well, of course, <laughs> they're too busy guiding others and <laughs> neglect their own children sometimes. You know, but they all have three monads, that one son that ends up making his beard go gray, right? No, alhamdulillah. My son is still not that old, <laughs> inshallah. Who knows what's going to happen later? But basically, what you need to do is invest in the proper friends, have proper surrounding around you. Because you need to face that stage of your child. They will think that you are not, you're stupid. You're not saying anything right. You cannot understand them. So invest in the proper friends. Yazid, uh, Abu Harb al subayi that's exactly what he said to Burayr ibn Khalid. Could you imagine? Only because of an immoral friend, not only he was taking the path of falsehood, but he was willing to kill the grandson, the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. Compare Karbala to the time before the reappearance of our awaited Imam Ajallah Ta'ala Faraj Sharif and you be the judge. Moving on to the second point. A second point that I wanted to make is that I would like to briefly reflect on the conditions of Kufa. I wanted to dissect the conditions of Kufa from a social perspective. Why? You see, when it comes to the events of Kufa, there exists two extreme schools of thought. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. There's a school of thought, or there's a group of people that have already formed an idea in their mind that the people of Kufa were a people of treachery and betrayal, and they betrayed Muslim Ibn Aqil, much less Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi himself. Yes? And other. For example, my community, Lebanese people, we love to blame Iraqis. We love to say it's all the Iraqis' fault. Not to say, oh, it's the Iraqis. They're the ones who killed Imam Hussein. Fine, you hear this a lot. We love it. No, <laughs> reality. And then you find the other extreme opposite school of thought, which comes and says that, no, the society of Kufa are a society of all Shias. They're all lovers of the Ahlul Bayt. But there are certain circumstances that occurred that prevented them from supporting Muslim Ibn Aqil and Imam Hussein alayhi salam on the land of Karbala. And believe it or not, both of them are absolutely wrong. If we were to look into the society of Kufa, number one, what I would like to say is that we would notice that the society of Kufa consisted of many fractions and ethnic backgrounds. It was a society of diverse ethnic ethnicities. It wasn't even a fully Muslim society. Many other religious communities existed in Kufa. And even to begin with, Kufa was built as a military base. And the Muslim military consisted of people from different sects of Islam and school of thought. So the society of Kufa was not fully Shia, in fact. It was a society that was so diverse. And even within the same tribe, believe it or not, there were, two, there were two different schools of thought. Take, for example, the tribe of Bani Kinda. Bani Kinda are a tribe that you would find the most devout Shia individuals within that tribe, like Hajr ibn Adi al-Kindi. On the contrary, you would find the most ones that hate Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, like who? Al-Ash'af ibn Qais al-Kindi. Bani Umayyah thoroughly worked on causing that split in every tribe. For example, they would go to Muhammad ibn al-Ash'af, the son of al-Ash'af, and they would promote him as the chief of the tribe of Bani Kinda. Why? So he can stand opposite to Hajr ibn Adi al-Kindi, and thereupon gain the loyalty, Bani Umayyah would gain the loyalty of Bani Kinda. Despite the fact also that Ibn Abi al-Hadid al-Mu'tazali, the Sunni scholar, he, he comes and says, that the Shias of Al-Kufa were, believe it or not, considered a minority. And even that minority were victims of ethnic cleansing. He documents those crimes, believe it or not, mainly after the martyrdom of Imam Al-Hasan Salawatullahi wa Salamuhu Alayhi. And believe it or not, what Muawiyah did, it is something that is called replacement and mapping. And by the way, that's how Qum was formed. It was the Shias that were pushed out by Bani Umayyah, and they were pushed out to go live in Qum. So basically, that was the society of Kufa, that even within the same house, by the way, the same house was not, everybody in the same house was not on the same aqidah. 
I'll give you an example. We all know that the killer of Ali al-Akbar sallallahu alayhi was none but Murrah ibn Munqidh al-Abdi. Isn't it? Yes. Murrah ibn Munqidh al-Abdi. What do you want more than a person that killed Ali al-Akbar alayhi salam? His sister, he had a sister named Mary al-Abdiya. Mary al-Abdiya was a devout Shia to the point that her house in Kufa was considered literally as an Imam Barga. And it was a house that Muslim Ibn Aqil resorted to to take bay'ah from the Kufans over there. So the society of Kufa consisted of many beliefs and aqaid on the, uh, at the same time. On the other hand, if we were to focus on certain incidents, then we would notice that the society of Kufa was never Shia, even from before, even during the reign of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. I'll give you an example. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib on his, best, on, his death, on his deathbed, what did he tell to his son Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam? He told him, oh Bunay, ghayyib qabri. Oh my son, hide my grave. See, why would he tell Imam al-Hasan to hide his grave? If the society of Kufa was a Shia society, he should have told him, oh my son Hasan, no, build a shrine on my grave. Let the Shias come and visit me, isn't it? Huh? But because he knows that he had many enemies in Kufa. So the second thing, Salatul Taraweeh, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam says this in Nahjul Balagha, you can read it in one of the sermons of Nahjul Balagha, where he said that when I arrived to Kufa and I saw people praying Salatul Taraweeh in the masjid, I told them that this is considered bid'ah. They all revolted against me, so I told them stay on your bid'ah. The third reason, Shuraih al-Qadi. Shuraih al-Qadi was a corrupt judge appointed by the second Khalifa. When Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam arrived to Kufa, he wanted to isolate Shuraih al-Qadi. But everybody rose against Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. So in reality, Kufa was not considered a Shia state to begin with for us to blame the Kufans whether they did support Muslim Ibn Aqil or whether they did abandon Muslim Ibn Aqil. But no one would deny that there has been an abandonment to Muslim Ibn Aqil alayhi salam, no doubt. But when we look into the conditions of what happened, mainly after the arrival of Abaydullah Ibn Ziyad to Kufa, then we can understand what really happened. And still, by the way, I'm not claiming that the black box of the events that occurred in Kufa, mainly with Muslim Ibn Aqil, is completely exposed. Not yet. History is still looking into what really occurred. Because there are many misconceptions, believe it or not. Just as an example on the side, not that I do want to enter the topic of many misconceptions, even within the journey of Muslim Ibn, Ab Ibn Aqil. Why? Because some people, unfortunately, I don't understand that they do um, say that when Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa sent Muslim Ibn Aqil and the two guides were lost in the desert, Muslim Ibn Aqil sent a letter to Imam Hussein alayhi salam and he told him that why don't you appoint someone that I am not worthy of this mission. And Imam Hussein alayhi salam replied back to him telling him, A'udhu Billah, do not be a coward and continue to Kufa. Is that that's an insult to Muslim Ibn Aqil? There's a beautiful hadith by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam Allahumma <laughs> And where he says, if my uncle Abu Talib were to father all humans, they will all be courageous and heroes. But Muslim Ibn Aqil was one of the generals of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam on, uh, on his army in the battle of Safin. So it's not that Muslim Ibn Aqil sallallahu wa sallam, alayhi, is the one that who would not fight and confront. And he proved it perfectly. But there are events that occurred in Kufa that in many cases sometimes we need to open up question marks around them. For example, the fact that we always repeat in our Masa'ib that Muslim Amin Aqil, for example, was lost or he lost his way in the neighborhoods of Kufa. When, when you look back into the life of or the biography of Muslim Ibn Aqil, you would notice that he was obviously married to the daughter of Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, and thereupon lived in Kufa for seven years. So why would he lose his way in the neighborhoods of Kufa? Right? Or many is such as misconceptions. But if we were to, and this is what leads me to the third point of our discussion tonight, is that if we were to look into what occurred or the procedures that Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad took upon his arrival to Kufa, then we can answer at least some of these misconceptions. For example, 
As soon as Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad arrived to Kufa, he commanded the governors and the mayors of the neighborhoods to get him a list of the Shias that live inside the city of Kufa. Second, he told them that I need a full report on anyone that did not give bay'ah to Yazid ibn Muawiyah. And that did not include only Shias, by the way. No. There were people that were not Shia. There were Muslims that were not Shias that did not agree to the reign of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Just to let you know. Right? Third, he shut down the gates of Kufa. Fourth, he placed checkpoints inside the city of Kufa. And he ordered the guards that any person, that even if you doubt a person is one of the followers of Muslim Ibn Aqil, then detain him on the spot. Another thing that he did was what? Was to capture the influential leaders of the Shia tribe, such as who? Al-Mukhtar and Hani Ibn Urwa, resulting in the killing of Hani Ibn Urwa, of course. Yes? What else? 12,000 prisoners in the prison of Kufa. All from the followers of Muslim Ibn Aqil. Or all, all majority of them are the ones who gave bay'ah to Muslim Ibn Aqil. And they upon one and two, support Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi and his cause. And many of that, because sometimes when we look into some narrations where they say that Muslim Ibn Aqil, for example, he let salat in, masjid, in the masjid, and then he looked behind him, and eventually resulting, it's a long narration, resulting in the fact that he even some narrations suggest that he looked at the people, and he saw that they, they, they looked like monkeys and pigs, meaning that they were hypocrites. You see, there were people behind Muslim Ibn Aqil praying salat that ended up becoming martyrs in Karbala, such as Muslim Ibn Ausajar, such as Abu Thumam al-Saydawi, such as Habib Ibn Mudahir al-Asadi. It's impossible that such people would abandon Muslim Ibn Aqil. On the contrary, you find that Muslim Ibn Aqil salawat Allah wa salam alayhi prayed salat and then he left. So was there an agreement between him and such personas to meet at a certain spot? Who knows? On the other hand, you find that Muslim Ibn Aqil alayhi salam began walking in the neighborhoods of Kufa. Walking in the neighborhoods of Kufa and then he reached a dead end where he leaned against the door or against the wall of the house of a woman named Tawha. Brothers and sisters, wallah, the injustices that were done on Muslim Ibn Aqil throughout history and up until this day are vast. The martyrdom of Muslim Ibn Aqil is no less than the martyrdom of Al-Abbas sallallahu alayhi And in fact, if you were to think about it, Muslim Ibn Aqil, Al-Abbas alayhi salam, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, they all martyred alone by themselves. A Muslim Ibn Aqil, when he leaned on the wall of the door of Tawha, it is narrated that she was standing on the door waiting for her son. He looked at her and he said, Amatullah, I need some water. She went and brought him water. And then when he drank water, he stayed on the door. She said, well, didn't you drink water? Well, why don't you leave that you cannot stand on the door of my house? Muslim Ibn Aqil said that I have nowhere to go. Why? He said that I am a gharib in Kufa all by myself right now. She said, what's your name? He said, I am Muslim Ibn Aqil. The narrations say that she welcomed him in. She was excited. And then she put him in one of the chambers of the house, in one of the rooms of the house. And she told him, hide here. The narrations say that her son returned back. And he saw her going in and out of that room, bringing him water, bringing him food, until she finally told him who was inside. The narration suggests that her son was none but a spy to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Muslim ibn Aqil alayhi salam spent the night in dua and in ibadah. And then by the morning, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad sent Muhammad ibn al-Ash'ar with a legion to capture Muslim ibn Aqil. The narration say, that Muslim Ibn Aqil alayhi salam stood up, uh, he took his sword, uh, and he went out and confronted them. He fought them courageously. 
one narration suggests that Muslim Ibn Aqil alayhi salam grabbed the gate of the house and he threw it up and then he went out and confronted them by himself and they surrounded him shooting him with arrows throwing rocks on him Muslim Ibn Aqil alayhi salam kept on fighting by himself encouraging himself and tawa on the other hand behind him cheering him on uh, for O oh, Mu'mineen Muslim Ibn Aqil alayhi salam was by himself uh, Muhammad ibn al-Ash'ath uh, he sent to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad uh, he told him Ubaidullah send me another legion send me more troops uh, as I am fighting Muslim Ibn Aqil uh, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad told him uh, he is only one man uh, and you have a full legion with you uh, he said that one man is Muslim Ibn Aqil that one man is the grandson of Abu Talib that one man is the nephew of Ali ibn Abi Talib O oh, Mu'mineen they were only able to defeat Muslim Ibn Aqil through a trick they dug a hole for him he fell into the hole and thereupon they captured him bleeding from his mouth bleeding from his head and they took him to Ubaidah Allah ibn Ziyad Muslim ibn Aqil entered upon Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad Umar ibn Sa'ad was standing there one of the guards told Muslim ibn Aqil why don't you salute the Emir recite the salam to the Emir Muslim ibn Aqil replied he is not my Emir Amiri Hussein wa ni'mal Amiri he said that my Amir is Hussein and he is the best of Amir he is the Amir worthy for me to call him Amir Amir Ali my Amir is Ali one like me would not salute a man like Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad oh mu'mineen looked at Muslim and she he said whether you salute me or not you shall be killed Muslim Ibn Aqil replied back to him saying I do not care if you were to kill me in fact I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that my death would be on the hands of the worst of his creatures then Ubaidullah Ibn Ziyad ordered the guards to take Muslim Ibn Aqil as he said by Allah I shall kill you in such a way that I will invent an innovation in Islam he commanded his guards to take him up to the roof of the palace he told them to cut off his head Muslim Ibn Aqil said allow me give me some time to pray to rak'at he stood in his salat Allahu Akbar and then he finished he stood up he pointed towards the path that leads to Karbala and he said Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. <laughs> Muslim ibn Aqil Zad was cut off. His body was thrown from the top of the roof down to the ground. It is narrated that Imam Hussein alayhi salam was on his way when he stopped and he said inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon and then he carried one of the daughters of Muslim Ibn Aqil he put his hand on her head she said oh uncle why are you doing to me what normally is done to the orphan I say Aba Abdullah al Hussein that the daughter of Muslim had her uncle uh, when her father was killed. Uh, yet your daughters uh, did not have anyone around them when you were killed on the land of Karbala, running from one tent to another. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن 
صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين يا حسين يا حسين يا حسين يا حسين